Thank you, and thanks for, sorry everyone, I feel like I'm extending your day beyond where you want to be, but thank you for moving me around. I literally had to be in two places at once earlier today, so. Um, okay, so today I'm going to, I've got my English Heritage hat on, um, and I'm going to talk about a project that we did at Tintagel Castle over the last couple of years. And I'm going to try and explore what happens when you try to deliver an interpretation scheme at a site um, which has particular local and regional um, um, vested interests and sort of show how those political sparks uh, might be set off. So for those who don't know, Tintadrill Castle sits on the north coast of Cornwall. It's managed by English Heritage but owned by the Duchy of Cornwall. Um, and it's, uh, this is a map from the Visit Cornwall uh, website. It's one of the key sites um, in Visit Cornwall marketing, key sites for um, attracting visitors to Cornwall and um, it's very much seen as an iconic site by um, Cornish people and visitors to Cornwall. Um, it's a site that receives over 200,000 visitors a year, mostly people on holiday, uh, largely families, and quite a number of overseas visitors, particularly from France and Germany. And um, it's a place that people tend to explore by themselves. As you can see, it's an incredibly rugged site. If you haven't been, I recommend a visit. Um, but uh, it's a, a quite an extensive site. There's lots of steps. There's quite large open areas. It's a place that people tend to explore by themselves rather than taking a, um, a guided tour or, or having some kind of um, set route. So um, this is a rather poor picture. I'm really sorry. But I'll read out what it says in the middle in a minute. Um, but the key perception about Tintagel Castle is that it's the home or the birthplace of King Arthur. This is a 1890s tourist um, photograph album, which sa says in the middle there, Tintagel, the headquarters of the legendary King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. And it's flanked by two photographs, which actually show uh, the 19th and early 20th century slate um, exporting uh, industry. <laughs> um, so all those derricks and wooden bits you can see are actually to do with the slate industry. Um, uh, so this area has a quite interesting industrial past, um, as well as all of the other layers of history that it has. Um, it was used um, particularly for mining um, and for slate exporting um, in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, so this is the kind of perception that our visitors still tend to have, um, and actually quite a number of people, um, even if they're not visiting, tend to have Tintagel, King Arthur, that, that's the link. And so people tend to climb all those steps up to the headland. And generally, before our project, um, we're quite disappointed in the remains of the castle. Um, <laughs> and we actually did quite a lot of visitor research at the beginning of our project, both people who are visiting the castle and people who are visiting Tintagel Village, but not actually paying to come into the castle. And about 17% of people thought that this was where King Arthur had lived. Not only did they think that King Arthur was real, but this was where he lived. So it's quite a major perception there about what the castle is. And of course, King Arthur has many associations. Uh, people bring their own ideas and their own links about what King Arthur means with them to the site. So it's not really surprising because up until this year, no, uh, yes, up until earlier this year, still in December, aren't we? Yep. <laughs> um, there was very limited information on the site for our visitors. There was a good guidebook, but there was these frankly um, useless interpretation panels on the site. There was about four of them. This one handily says, the history of Tintagel spans nearly 2,000 years and is still shrouded in mystery. What is known provides little basis for the Arthurian legend. However, when the mists come swirling through Merlin's cave, it is easy to see how the myth has survived to this day. Possibly the most useless interpretation panel I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> So no wonder people were confused. And in fact, in 2010, um, Hilary Orange um, and Patrick Lavalliet wrote a paper in the Journal of Public Archaeology about the site, and they called it a disgruntled tourist in King Arthur's court. And they set out as to how visitors were arriving with ideas of King Arthur and leaving having no clue whatsoever about what they just visited. Everyone has a lovely time because it's a beautiful site, but they were not leaving with any better information than what they'd arrived with. So um, our project, we, English Heritage, we've known for years that the interpretation at Tintagel is not good. Um, and finally, we got the money to do quite a major interpretation project there a couple of years ago. Um, and we wanted to try and um, rebalance uh, what was being told to our visitors. Aside from these interpretation panels, there was also a short video in the next to the shop in the introduction to the site. And it was quite a lot of dry ice um, and basically lots of messages that said King Arthur was never here. Um, 
And so um, we wanted to try and show how the history and the legend at this site are completely intertwined and how actually it's really important to understand why the site is associated with the legend and what the actual association is and what's the history, the archaeology of the site and how the two combined. Um, the two are completely interlinked and you can't really tell one without the other. Um, and it's really important to us to tell the full story of Tintagel so that it can kind of inform not only just our visitors but also debates about local and national identity um, related to Tintagel. So I'm just going to give you a really short two minute kind of potted history of Tintagel so that you can see where the debate fits in. Um, oh, sorry, that's the... That's the reference. That was a bit rubbish of me, wasn't it? That's the reference of um, Hilary Orange's paper. She's actually writing a follow-up paper to that now at the moment about what we've just done. So I think that will be coming out in the same journal um, next year. Um, this is the Royal Commission um, Earthwork Survey of the site, which was done in the 1980s. Um, it shows you um, all of the red outlines there are um, mostly the remains of um, the early medieval settlement on the site, which existed between the 5th and the 7th centuries AD. Um, all of these, um, the more solid earthworks down in the bottom right-hand corner are to do with the castle, but the vast majority of what you're looking at there dates from that period. And we have about 100 building platforms. This is a major settlement. And uh, here's a reconstruction that we did as part of our project to show vaguely what that settlement might have looked like. We, we don't actually know because we don't really understand that much about that settlement. But it's probably a high-status settlement. It's likely to have been the seasonal home of regional elites, possibly you could call them kings related to the powerful kingdom of Dumnonia. It's a time when masses of Mediterranean pottery is being imported to the site, more than any other site in, in Britain at the time. Um, and so it has links into a Mediterranean tra trading network. Um, they're probably importing things like wine and olive oil. They're importing tablewares, fine tablewares, glasswares, um, basically elite stuff. Um, and this is a really interesting time because um, after the collapse of Roman rule, Cornwall sort of becomes slightly more Romanized than the rest of the country. It's quite, a, quite an odd thing that happens. Um, there seems to be an elite connection to the Roman world, to the Mediterranean world, which continues in this sort of almost power vacuum sort of after the main Roman rule leaves. And of course, Cornwall doesn't become particularly Romanized in the first place. So there's a really interesting story there, which we don't really understand. But Tintagel is pretty key to understanding that story. So the next time that Tintagel becomes significant is in the 12th century, and it's very much a literary reference, and this is when Geoffrey of Monmouth writes in his History of the Kings of Britain about how Arthur was magically conceived, not born, key, key difference, <laughs> at Tintagel. And Geoffrey is thought to have visited Tintagel because he describes it very, very clearly. He describes how it has a narrow entrance and how it has a, is surrounded by the sea on all sides. And so it's thought, we don't really know why Geoffrey chose Tintagel as the place um, for this story. But basically, we assume that there are some remnants of the earlier settlement there. There's some memory of the idea that there was an important place here, that it was known as the place of you know, Cornish power, Cornish elites and Cornish kings. Um, so um, we don't really understand what... What, why Geoffrey chose the site, but it basically sparks the connection, and that connection remains to the present day. There's also another story associated with the site, aside from King Arthur, much less well-known, which is the love story of Tristan and Isolde. If you ever want to read anything of Tristan and Isolde, I recommend the Barul's version. It's actually a, a really good read, much better than um, any of the Mallory King Arthur stuff, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> um, but basically, this is a story which is again associated with Tintagel. It's all set at Tintagel, at King Mark's <coughs> castle, which is at Tintagel. And um, um, it's a very key connection for, for the later medieval history of the site, which I haven't got really time to go into today. But suffice to say, there's another story there which is important. The castle itself is built in the 1230s by Richard, Earl of Cornwall. He's the brother to Henry III. Sorry, Henry II. Mis mistake there. Um, sorry, he gives, gives his younger brother, who's only 18 months younger than him and much richer than him for most of his life, um, he gives him Cornwall as an 18th birthday present. Um, and so Richard immediately purchases this headland. I know, good 18th birthday present, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> he, gives them the, um, he immediately buys this headland and starts to build a castle there. And the reason that he buys this particular headland, which doesn't have any defensive um, purpose, really, is probably because it's, it's, its association with these earlier stories, its association with Arthur, and its association with kind of being the seat of Cornish um, control. So he's basically sticking his castle on the most important place in Cornwall. 
And we have really good evidence from the time of um, Richard that his relationship with the Corn was, his Cornish subjects was not necessarily a happy one. And there's quite a history of rebellion by the Cornish people against particularly the, um, what became the duchy. So all of the money from the stanneries from the tin mines was going straight into the crown to fund um, Richard's campaign in Europe. And um, um, I think there was kind of quite a lot of um, unhappiness about the fact that that was happening um, amongst the local subjects. And he never really um, takes on any Cornish um, kind of servants or Cornish uh, knights. And he, there's no, no Cornishman becomes a signature one, to one of his charters, for example, even though he's there quite a lot and has three other castles in Cornwall. That's uh, Richard. Um, and then finally, um, to talk about the later history, um, the Arthurian stories go on after Geoffrey of Monmouth to be developed in French literature and European literature, but in the Victorian period, particularly um, uh, uh, stimulated by Mallory's publication of Mort d'Arthur, um, this basically opens the doors to a whole series of paintings, of poetry, of um, uh, novels, spin-off books, basically an Arthurian kind of uh, gold rush. And a key to Tintagel was Alfred Lord Tennyson, who visited and was inspired to write um, his Idylls of the King. And uh, after that, there becomes this huge influx of tourists in Victorian. Um, basically, the, t- the village of Tintagel was set up to cater for those tourists. So that's a bit of a potted history. Um, I hope that I've shown you that Tintagel is kind of part of a European story. It's part of an English royal story. It's part of a Cornish story. It's part of a Western British um, early medieval story, a Mediterranean story. Um, uh, this is the new exhibition that we um, installed um, about 18 months ago. And uh, what we try to do is tell all of that quite complicated story. I've given you a very, very potted version of it in, a, in an exhibition. Um, and we tried to give the message... The exhibition was called Where History Meets Legend, and it was trying to give the idea that the two things are intertwined, and you can't really understand one without the other. So the exhibition had um, a model, a 3D model, um, which showed how the site changed through time, it also had um, some book sculptures which were trying to tell um, different aspects of the stories about the site. And it also had, for the first time at Tintagel, real archaeological objects on display from the site. We also installed a series of 18 interpretation panels and labels across the site, um, four of which had these additional kind of bronze <coughs> sculptural details on them. We did this because um, we get a huge number of family visitors, and um, we wanted, as I said, people tend to explore Tintagel by themselves. And we wanted to provide something that was kind of um, <coughs> both you could read and look at, also kids could have a touch and feel, but it was appealing to everybody. And um, four of these panels have a story. Basically, you can see the one at the bottom there is called The Priest's Tale. Um, and it's written as a story. So it's written on, a, on about a real historical thing that we know happens about a priest that basically got fed up with his post at the chapel at St. and um, quit because he wasn't being paid enough. It's a familiar story. But um, he, um, that's a story that we've told on that panel deliberately. And... Um, What's, what I'm really pleased about, actually, with these panels is that in our visitor survey that we did this summer, um, the panels came second highest about what people enjoyed about the site. You would never expect interpretation panels to come high up, but they did. And um, so that just shows that people are really taking this on board and really enjoying looking at them. We also installed four other elements to the site, um, outdoor elements, um, which were artistic and which were um, basically pulling on the stories of the site to try and tell a little bit more about the associated story. So this was in the garden, which is associated with the Tristan and Isolde story. And we installed six what we called story slabs, which basically you walk, perambulate around the garden, and you read the story, and you get a little sense of the Tristan and Isolde love story. Before, everybody just looked at the garden and went, it's a garden, because it's just an open space surrounded by a wall and kind of carried on. Whereas now, people actually have to walk around the garden and learn about the story, and there's another panel at the, at the entrance which tells them about what we actually think is going on with the garden. We also installed slightly more controversial things, and you may have seen these already in the news. Um, we installed um, the statue you can see there, um, uh, which was made by an artist uh, called Ruben Ennion, who we commissioned to make both this statue and the bronze sculptures that you saw on the panels. And um, this was installed on the far side of the island, partly deliberately on that side because we have a huge erosion problem at Tintagel. And we wanted to disperse visitors out from the Great Hall area and from the really um, densely kind of uh, archaeological remains on the eastern side of the island. This was a deliberate decision to try and get people out across the other side of the island and spread them out a bit more. Um, The name of the statue is Galos, which means power in Cornish. And the idea of the artist, which, I mean, he came to us with this idea. We didn't necessarily change it a huge amount. 
We had a bit of a debate about whether he should have a crown or not, but other than that, we, we just went with what the artist came up with, which was to try and show that we have all these kingly and kind of powerful figures associated with Tintagel. We have unnamed post-Roman kings. We have the figure of Arthur. We have Richard, Earl of Cornwall. We don't actually know if Richard ever visited Tintagel. So he's kind of there, not there, and he's supposed to represent the sense of these figures being at Tintagel, but not necessarily being there. That, that was the artist's idea. Um, and on the left, you can see um, the carving of Merlin, which we installed down on the beach. Now, this has been particularly controversial, um, and I'll explain a little bit why in a minute about why that might be. But this is about the size of my face, and it's deliberately hidden around the corner of a rock. You can't actually see it unless you look for it. The whole point was that you might discover it as you're exploring the beach, as you're going into Merlin's cave. And that beach is incredibly volatile. Those metal steps that you can see there, we replace every year because they get washed away by the storms. And we don't expect this to stay particularly long. Those, those rocks, OK, they're, they're, they're rocks, but it's not a permanent installation. It will probably go in about 10 years' time, or at least it'll erode to the point where you can't actually tell it's not a natural um, face. So um, as you probably saw in the news, we didn't exactly have the most positive reaction to this scheme when we opened it. Um, you can read the headlines for yourself, and I'm sure most of you have read some of the articles. Um, we were aware of the sensitivities about English heritage in Cornwall, and I'll explain a bit about that in a minute. But, uh, and we knew that we were going to have negative reactions, but we didn't necessarily expect this amount of negative reaction. We were fully aware of um, the uh, Cornish nationalist groups in Cornwall, and we've been working with them for some time um, beforehand about various ways that we could help not impose English heritage on them. There's a um, particular, um, I'll, sh I'll show you in a second, but there's, we have particular issues, obviously, in Cornwall with our name. So we don't use our own name on anything. We don't put English heritage on any of our signage. We don't fly our flag at any of our sites. We fly the St. Piran's flag instead. And we don't use our strap line there, which is in the rest of the country, it's step into England's story. But we don't use that in Cornwall for obvious reasons. So we have made quite a number of um, changes in Cornwall over, over the last five years to help um, with these issues. Um, and um, we had been meeting with various groups in Cornwall for a long time. Um, so all of these headlines were not necessarily generated by visitors to the site. Um, these were generated particularly by some of the Cornish nationalist groups who were really upset about what we'd done at Tintagel. And I think uh, I was on the one show about this. Somebody mentioned the one show being earlier as being a very large audience. We've been trying to get on the one show for Tintagel for years. <laughs> <laughs> this, was our, this is when we got on the one show. Um, so actually, this wasn't from visitors. Our visitor feedback over the summer, we've done a lot of evaluation work, is overwhelmingly positive. Um, so it's not necessary for people who have visited the site. And in particular, when we invited some of the most negative people to come and visit the site, to meet with us, to see what we'd done, to have a bit of an explanation about what we'd done. They refused to come on site, and they refused to come and see what we'd done. So it's quite difficult to try and explain things. Now, this was partly our fault. I mean, in fact, I would say there was a number of things we could have done very differently. Um, a badly timed press release went out, which made Merlin's face look enormous, which it wasn't. Uh, there was no setting of that in the context of the wider scheme that we'd installed, which included the exhibition, the interpretation, etc. And we could have done a lot more consultation. We did do consultation with the local village and with visitors, and we went through the normal planning process. So we consulted with Natural England, with our Historic England inspectors, with the Cornwall Council. But that wasn't enough. We should, probably should have done a lot more. But there's also, from our point of view, a huge pressure on English heritage as a new charity to make money. And we have to attract visitors to our sites. And we have to do innovative things to attract visitors to our sites if we're going to survive. So the bottom line is that we have huge pressure on us to do interesting and fun things at our sites. So um, the background to this really is that there have been growing call calls for Cornwall to be a separate country um, since the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And um, in, to be recognised as a duchy rather than a county particularly. Um, in April 2014, the Cornish were granted minority status and funding was given for increased teaching and resources to do with the Cornish language, although that funding was actually reduced last year again. 
as a small but vocal minority, believe that Cornwall sites should be managed by a Cornish heritage organisation rather than English heritage, who they perceive as sitting in London and not having the best wishes of the local people at heart. One of the major things that comes back to us is you take money out of Cornwall. It's a bit like Richard Earl of Cornwall taking his money out of Cornwall. Actually, English heritage puts far more money into Cornwall than it takes out, but it's hard to get that message across. So um, there's, this is part of a wider case for Cornwall um, devolution, where they would like everything, this is the NHS, Historic England, English Heritage, to be run by Cornish <coughs> organisations. So that's an interesting process, and that process will be going on. Sorry, my time's up. Um, so just to say, this doesn't, um, it's not just words and newspaper headlines, it's direct action. This is what happens to our signs if we do use our logo. It even extends to just kind of reducing the word, taking the word out of English, even on the interpretation panel. Uh, admittedly, this is a very poor interpretation panel, but... <laughs> <laughs> and it's not particularly clear-cut. Um, these are the, this is the percentage of people who identify as Cornwall, sorry, as Cornish um, in the last census. Um, admittedly, there's a lot of people in Cornwall who wouldn't necessarily think of themselves as Cornish if they're second homeowners or retirees, but this shows you that um, generally it's, it's quite a spread... Um, group of people and, and not necessarily a coherent story about who identifies as Cornish. So it's not necessarily a clear-cut issue. And of course, archaeology and history are intensely political matters here, and many of the Cornish nationalist groups have turned to um, history, archaeology, and even DNA that you heard about earlier to um, set their own case as being the separate nation that they would like to be. So... <coughs> We had tried. We put Cornish language into our exhibition on our panels. We'd met with these groups over a number of years. Um, and I think, I hope as I managed to get across in my earlier potted history of the site, we were trying to tell the story of Tintagel, the, the true, the accurate, I don't know how you would want to phrase it, the real story of Tintagel, rather than it being just about King Arthur, but also not being just the dry archaeology that people couldn't engage with. Oops. So despite... This and um, you know, despite all of these issues, um, our attempts to push the boundaries of, of the on-site interpretation um, have been seen as um, sort of highly negative. But actually, I'm intensely proud of what we've done at Tintagel, and I'll defend it to the hilt because I spent a lot of time thinking about what we should be doing at Tintagel. Our visitor surveys come back as ridiculously positive. We are, have increased visitors tenfold on what we normally have in our summer season, and. Um, I think that we have to do quite challenging and quite prov provocative stuff sometimes, even though it means we sometimes get a little bit bitten in the process. Thank you for listening. Sorry I went over.